one of my biggest takeaways was the conversation that continued to revolve around the carrot and the stick. The U.S. giving the carrot when it comes to the energy transition, when it comes to the IRA, and Europe giving uh, the stick. What is the most successful policy? What do you think the U.K. is going to do? Tough question to ask what the UK is going to do. I think you're right. There's a bit of a carrot and a stick here. The critical piece for me is actually long-term stability. So what the US has done really well with the Inflation Reduction Act is give a 10-year window of certainty around some of the investments we're making. It's also front-end loaded many of the regulatory support that it has given. I think what Europe has done really well is to be able to look at incentivizing both the demand as mm -hmm. well as the supply. So I think that's something that Europe has. Um, but what we need is stability and we need long term stability because these investments are long term investments but are you and to finding the right while? balance are, are, are you changing how you allocate capital based on the different approaches in the different regions we continue to invest heavily in the U.S. It is our single biggest investment market at the moment. Yes, we do see uh, more of the investment coming into the U.S., in particular because of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, more on our exact capital allocation to come in June when we have our Capital Markets Day update. Okay, so so we'll see. Do you think we're going to enter, though, into some kind of subsidy war between Europe, the U.K., and the U.S.? Is that is that your sense there on the ground? I really hope not. I think this is more, uh, at least I hope, that we rise uh, upwards altogether and that we do need those, these incentives to be able to create um, investable opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so I do think there's a, there's a real space here for Europe to be able to uh, match some of what uh, the U.S. is doing, but also for yeah. the two, uh, two markets to continue to work together on this. While there was uh, some reporting that Shell was considering relocating to the U.S., uh, I'm wondering if you can take me behind behind some of the discussions that might have taken place or why that might be a viable thesis? Because I'm wondering if it has to do with some of the treatment uh, in the IRA. I think this uh, the story that came out is is one of um, when we were going through our headquarter move to to relocate out of the uh, the Netherlands to the UK. Of course, it's only natural that we looked at all the alternatives and very quickly landed on the UK as being as being the option that we wanted to go to. Um, being a UK headquartered company does not in any way uh, reduce our appetite to invest in the US and beyond the invest. We are ultimately a, an international energy company. Mm -hmm. uh, inflation reduction. Act will indeed attract more of our capital, uh, as will other opportunities created in other markets as well. Other markets uh, leads me to what you said today uh, at Sarah Week, talking about how uh, Europe got by with a lucky strategy, meaning that it got a little warmer over the winter, so it survived the winter even with the energy crisis. Does that? Can I infer from that that you think that Europe should be getting into more longer-term LNG contracts to avoid the luck strategy? Let me qualify. It wasn't a luck strategy. I said it was a combination of self-help and luck. The luck came from two specific dimensions. One is the weather was a lot milder than other winters. Mm -hmm. And secondly, China was not off-taking a lot of the liquefied natural gas, which it typically would because of the zero-COVID zero, zero COVID policy. Mm -hmm. um, and so those those dimensions meant that Europe was able to attract more of, uh, more of the LNG than otherwise it, it would have. Uh, I do think, though, Europe has the opportunity to put some more structural measures and to your point around term contracts, absolutely, there needs to be term contracts so that you are not subjected to the volatility that comes with a spot market. Mm -hmm. So that seems like a yes. Uh, I think that many uh, other uh, gas suppliers would agree with you. Um, let, so let's turn to oil for a moment. Um, BP recently made adjustments to its strategy. They're going to be spending more on oil and gas uh, than they had expected to. Um, Shell has a commitment to allow output to decline about 1% to 2%. They announced that back in 2019. Are you sticking to that, or are you going to have to readjust that? More on that in Capital Markets Day in June. What we have done over the past few years is we have really been able to high grade our portfolio of assets in upstream. And mm -hmm. what that has resulted in is a, a lot higher margin portfolio than we had in the past. We call it the value over volume strategy. Uh, and so a lot of what we had anticipated to do across the decade, we were able to do in a shorter time. And therefore, we're able to achieve uh, that portfolio high grading mm -hmm. in a lot shorter time 
time than what we uh, otherwise would. And so in June, we will be able to guide the market as to what happens from here on. So let me ask it in a different way, and I appreciate you have to wait for your capital markets day, but could you give me a sense of where you may be interested in trying to grow production? Um, all the CEOs I talked to, and especially the oil services, are talking much more about deep water and offshore in a way that they haven't in years. I'm biased given I ran the deep water business for Shell here in the U.S. a few years ago. So absolutely, I see more in the deep water space, uh, but also other markets. We continue to invest in places like Malaysia at the moment, in places like Kazakhstan mm -hmm. and others. Um, but in essence, where we see running room in some of these investment opportunities, the, the, the U.S., of course, Gulf of Mexico is a big one. Brazil is a big one for us. So um, we have a, a set of eight core assets in our upstream business, mm -hmm. and we have significant investment opportunities in our gas businesses, such as in Qatar and in, uh, in Canada, for example. Uh, while where do you think in that portfolio it will allow your valuation to re-rate? In that your share price has now caught up with, say, Exxon and actually outperformed recently, but on a price-to-earnings multiple, you are half of what Exxon is. How do you get that higher? What do you, how do you get better credit for what you have? Um, great question. I think one is performance and two is discipline. Performance in the sense that we know we left money on the table. We need to be able to have a track record of consistent performance quarter in, quarter out. And that's what I'm very much focused on. Mm -hmm. Discipline in how we allocate our capital, whether that's allocating the capital to deleveraging, allocating the capital in terms of shareholder distributions, or the choices that we make in the capital we invest back into our businesses. All of those we have a very keen eye on to be able to deliver the returns that are expected. Uh, that our shareholders expect of us. Is that going to mean, though, investing more in the stuff that has higher returns versus, say, alternative energy or energy transition where the returns are unknown yet? More to come on that and in, in the way we split it. But it's fair to say that this is a balanced strategy that we see. We are investing for short-term returns, but we're also positioning ourselves to be able to create the longer-term returns with, um, with, with the right low-carbon and zero-carbon opportunity. So it's an and rather than, than an or, Alex. Yeah, that very much echoes what uh, BP has been saying as well. You just haven't gotten credit for that yet. Um, Macro for a moment before I let you go. I asked this to Mike Worth of Chevron. Do you think we see $100 oil before we see 60 or vice versa? Oof. Um, the one thing I've always gotten wrong is guessing oil prices. It's fair to say the fundamentals show a tight market at the moment. So uh, it's more likely to be on the higher side than the lower side. Uh, but the biggest questions in my mind are, are what happens uh, to the economies of this world. Uh, there was some recessionary uh, mm -hmm. uh, looks coming into the end of last year. That seems to have eased, so that's a bit of an upside. Uh, and then the second big one is how quickly will China's demand come up? Uh, those two big ones, I think, are the key ones on the demand side. On the supply side, it typically is what happens in OPEC and the shale patch, and we watch both of those with interest.